All right, well, <clears throat> we are going to kick off. We're going to be looking at um, 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 4. The title of this message is Love Each Other. So 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to be going through verses 1 through 10. I'll just read it here. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Say, done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil, uh, for evil man desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of disposition, and they have heaped abuse on you. Who's ever been abused because you're a Christian? But they will have to give an account to them, or to him, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regards to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Say pray. Above all, love each other. Say love each other. Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Say without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So today we're going to be talking about love each other and what that means, but, but in relation to the body. Who's, a, who's a each other? I'm a each other. Did you know that? We all, we all each other, <laughs> okay? So when the scripture is calling us to love each other, what it's talking to here in this context is the body of Christ. Love each other. Learn to love each other. Openly display hostility as the Lord has given it. So we're in chapter one of, or I'm sorry, chapter four of First Peter. Here the apostle is wrapping up his letter. In fact, what he's doing is he's, he's basically giving a long salutation. This is a long goodbye to this letter. He's been preparing them for the possibility of persecution or even now that we know through history, even death. So 1 Peter 4, 1 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. So since Jesus suffered, arm yourself with that attitude. So in, in other words, it's, it's, if it happened to the Son of God, if it happened to the very Son of God, the highest, like just the Son of God, God himself in flesh, if it could happen to him, why couldn't it happen to us? I remember my dad sharing with me a story, and I believe you preached this too, of of a pastor friend who, who was preaching in an underground church when suddenly the secret service busted in, showed up, arrested him, and a number of others who were with him. They also arrested the man who owned the property, the building that they were meeting in, and in about half, seven hours of interrogation, they finally released the pastor with a strong warning to leave the country. They took away their visas and gave them a time limit in which to flee. But because this pastor was not a national of that company or uh, that country, the pastor thought, well, I'm released because the Olympics are soon coming to this country in just a matter of months here, and they don't want to tarnish what's going on. So they'll, they'll release me instead of what they would have done and have done historically to other Christians. I asked him what happened to the man who owned the building, and he said that no one heard from that pastor for over three months. He just disappeared. 
or as my four-year-old daughter says, disappeared. He disappeared. Well, then he reappeared three months later, but in the meantime, both his home and his property, the building where they were meeting for that underground church, they were burned and totally destroyed. So that's not in America, right? That didn't happen in America, and this true story, that didn't happen in America. But even though things are not really getting any better for us here in America, we really don't relate to that kind of persecution, do we? I mean, no one of us can really say, well, I've had quite literally everything taken from me because I believe in Jesus. We still have hope in our nation, don't we? Nevertheless, how should we look at the future? Should we say, well, persecution happens in other countries, it's likely to happen here in America also, so I'm just going to cower in a corner somewhere, and I'm just going to hope that things get better, or should we aggressively go after the kingdom of God? We all know the right answer to say, but have we confirmed the right answer in our heart? I believe we have the same I believe we have the same attitude as the local man in that true story had even though they knew it could cost them their lives they continued to push forward with the gospel because what other hope do you ultimately have as a believer what other hope is stronger than the hope of resurrecting with Christ what else is there what is the the pinnacle hope of someone's life outside of you're going to live with Christ forever. I mean, tell me what other good kind of hope there could be. These people in that country operated with this mindset that if they don't get people converted into Christ, their society is going to continue to deteriorate and deteriorate and deteriorate. Now, I don't want us, especially here in our city, but in our country, I don't want us to make the mistake of waiting until things get better before we start to seek the Lord for something. We shouldn't wait until things get better before we start to seek the Lord. We must arm ourselves with the same attitude Christ had when He went to the cross. So, I want us to look back at this verse again, but let's look at the second half of it. I'll read the whole verse. Therefore, since Christ suffered in His body... Arm yourselves also with the same attitude because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Say, done with sin. So this verse can be looked at from a couple different perspectives. The perspective I'm going to come from is the idea that once we have determined to arm ourselves with the same attitude as Christ, our struggles with sin, say, disappeared. <laughs> Our struggles with sin disappear when we arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ. So, obviously, you know, if we die and we go to heaven, our struggles with sin is going to be over, right? And, but that doesn't address how we can live a victorious life here on earth today. What we can't do is we can't say, well, one day in heaven, my struggles are going to be over, but right now, I'm content with the struggle over sin. That's not a victorious life. That's not a victorious mindset. That's not living in the victory of Christ. To say, oh, I just got to put up with my sinfulness until I die. <laughs> that sounds pretty bleak, and that sounds pretty anti-gospel. And if it's anti-gospel, it's anti-Christ. But the next, uh, the next verse here really brings this out. 1 Peter 4, 2, As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the, say, will of God. So when we, when we arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ and we're consumed with the will of God, we don't live sin. We live victory. As a result of arming ourselves with the attitude of Christ and dying to self, we do not need to live the rest of our earthly life giving in to carnal desires. We must keep 
the context of this book in mind. Because Peter is writing to a group of Christians, a group of people who are suffering persecution and death. They are literally dying for the cause. They're, they're being beat up. They're being mistreated. They're having property seized from them. Their business is being shut down. They're being overtaxed. Everything is being done to make their life miserable because they're believing in a resurrected Savior. Our human nature allows our flesh to dominate our thinking and actions whenever we suffer, don't it? I mean, when we suffer, what do we want to do? Oh, if only I could just get back at them. If only, you know, our human nature rivals up there. But in human thinking, and I, I, I think everybody in here is a human like I am, so hopefully we'll have some relatability on this. But in human thinking, when your evil neighbor or your despicable coworker does something evil to you, it's very easy to imagine something wicked happening to them, isn't it? Like, man, I, you know, they should just walk across the highway with their blindfold on. Like, like or, man, I hope they get polio. Or, like, like something just, what? Just the other day I was thinking to myself, I said, self, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it, wouldn't it just be great or wouldn't it just be easier if certain political figures would just die? I mean, why are they living so long? They should just shrivel up and die. Wouldn't it be easier on our political system if these oppositions would just die? Right? It's easy to get into that kind of thinking, isn't it? It's easy to fall into that kind of thinking, especially when their political ideas are not my ideas or their position in the company is the position I would like to have or the pay that they're making is the pay that I really want to I really want to have it's much more difficult to return good for good or good for evil isn't it because that's really what Jesus did he returned good for evil to the very people who crucified him, he returned good and offered them salvation. And who's thankful for that? Peter then goes on to talk about the pressure that we're all living under in, in verses 3 and 4. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry, they think it's strange that you do not plunge into them with the same flood of disposition that they heap abuses on you. There's a consistent pressure on us who live in this world to do what they do. It would be much easier to do other things on Sunday, wouldn't it? Right? Especially when you're trying to make a paycheck and you're trying to get caught up on debt and you're trying to do all these things, it's really easy to fall in the mindset, well, I could work overtime on Sunday. Man, if I could, it would just be easier just to go to the bar every night and, and drink away problems instead of dealing with problems. It would be a lot easier to do that, right? It would be easier to just take drugs and to forget what I need to be fixing in my life instead of making it better. I'm just going to continue a path to make it worse and then I'm going to die and then it's going to be all done and then I don't have to worry about it. Right? It'd be easy to fall into that kind of mindset and for those who have been saved out of it, you know what I'm talking about. Right? Anybody with me here? Okay. It'd be easy to fall into the pressures and do what the world does to relieve us of that pressure. Now, I'm going to talk about they. <laughs> Who is they? They are someone other than us, right? They, in this context, is the world. They control popular thought. They control media. They control entertainment and the entertainment industry. They think it's strange when we don't plunge into the same kind of sins. I find it really interesting how the Scripture uses the word plunge. What is it to plunge? It's not dipping your toe in. It's, it's not like, oh, I've got to make sure this water is good. It's no, run, belly flop, plug the nose and jump in. Right? Cannonball, here I come. 
I'm giving my all to this. I'm plunging into it. They find it strange that we don't plunge into the same type of sin that they do. And so they heap abuse upon us. That's precisely what Peter is starting uh, this chapter off with by saying that if we have the attitude of Christ, we can live above the evil desires of flesh. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is near. What a statement. This declaration is evidently designed to support and to encourage them in their trials. Look, people, I know that you're going through persecution. I know that you're dying. I know that things are being taken from you, but hold fast because the end of all things is near. This declaration, it's to motivate them to lead a holy life by the assurance that the end of all things is drawing near. The phrase, end of all things, say end of all things, would naturally refer to the end of the world, right? You, would, you could see how that would, that would be. It would be the natural end of the world or the natural end of human affairs. But it's not, I'm not absolutely certain, however, that the apostle used it here in that sense. It might mean so far as they were concerned, like, or with respect to them and their situation, the end of all the things you're going through is drawing near. Hold fast, the end is coming. Death is to teach one of us, any of us, that the end of all things below is it. We have that understanding, right? We naturally have that understanding that death would just take it all away, right? It's easy to fall into the trap of thinking through human reasoning that if I just die, my problems are going to go away, right? Come on, I want some feedback. Let me know you're alive here. Or maybe maybe here's the death. I don't know. (laughs) It's easy in human reasoning and human understanding and human ideas to say, wow, I just, if I could just die, my problems would go away. It's easy to fall into that trap. But then we have to reconcile that with the hope of living forever. Why is it that we have a hope to live forever? Because there is a forever to live. And that's what Jesus came to tell us, is that we should live with him forever. I think we're benefited more by applying this phrase to our earthly life than to the return of Christ. And that's because of what the rest of the verse says here in 4.7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and say this, self-controlled, so that you can what? Pray. Be clear-minded, self-controlled, so that you can pray. It could be that, hey, Prayer brings the end to all these things. Prayer brings the end to all your struggles. Prayer brings the end to your struggle, your your striving, your trying to pursue your own desires and living defeated because you're just not getting what you think you should have. Prayer brings the end. If we believe that the reference to the end of all things is the return of Christ, that would give some people license to not be clear-minded or to not be self-controlled. Their attitude becomes one of skepticism, thinking that there is no way Jesus is coming soon enough. They could justify worldliness of all types. They could say, well, look, I'm saved, but I'm just going to do whatever I want to do because, look, I'm already saved. Look, I can just, I can just do whatever I want to do. Jesus is coming back. The end is near. The end is coming. I know I'm saved, so I can just do whatever I want to do. I don't have to show restraint. I don't have to show self-controlled. I don't have to pray. I don't have to be clear-minded. Jesus is coming back for me. I know I'm saved. I'm good. I'm just going to do whatever I want to do but call myself a Christian. Peter is saying, in essence, none of us know when our lives will end. So live like you may die today because that will encourage you to maintain a strong prayer life. Live like Jesus is coming back in one minute. What would you do differently with your life if that was true? What would you do differently with your life? How would you pray? How would you be clear-minded? Isn't it interesting how he puts the focus 
of this on the necessity of prayer? I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't expect anything else coming from a church like Prayer House, right? <laughs> but the emphasis, the necessity is on prayer. The end is near, so pray. There is nothing more important to you than your prayer life. And one of the things, last Wednesday, I encourage you to come Wednesday night, 6.30. Last Wednesday, we talked about prayer. A lot of us will agree, yeah, we should pray, but do we know how to pray? Scripture says you don't even know how to pray, so pray in the Spirit. So we need to learn how to have this relationship that the Lord has given us all the tools to build up in Him. It's important. Our prayer life is important. Who wants to stand? I want to ask you to raise your hands on this, but who wants to stand in front of Jesus never having spoke to Him before? I mean, think of it in that kind of a phrase or that kind of an idea, word picture. Who wants to stand in front of the King of kings, the Lord Almighty, the one who we profess our love and our faith for and in? Who wants to stand in front of him never having spoke to him before? Or who wants to stand before him never, heard, never having heard his voice before? Or never having been obedient to him? None, I don't know in any kind of a rational Christian mindset that any one of us would want to stand before the king of kings and not know who he is. When we stand before the Lord, we are all going to want to have a sense of having accomplished much for him and the prayer life relates to our effectiveness. So 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply. Say that with me. Love each other deeply. Because love covers seven sins. Oh, no, multitude. I guess I read that wrong. I guess I read what I wanted to read. But that's what we do, isn't it? We read what we want to read. Oh, his sin is not acceptable. Oh, that unspoken sin that I'm the only other person that knows about, that's an acceptable sin. But I like them enough, I guess I'll still be their friend. Or uh, that sin over there, oh my goodness, did you see the lifestyle transformation that she made? Who, we can't forgive that. We can't, we can't, no. Love covers how many sins? Multitude. I said all that I did to get us to this particular point. This is the verse where I got the title of the message. Everything Peter dealt with in the first few verses, comes down to this one point, and that is to love each other. And as I said in the past, I'm not talking about like hippie love, smoke pot, and just have orgies. I'm talking about true Christ-centered love, the actual definition of love, not what the world has distorted or tainted or convinced us that this is the definition of love. I'm talking about the actual godly kind of love. He even relates our prayer life to our ability to love. One of the things that's very hard to do is love the people that you do not pray with. It's very hard to love people that you do not pray with. And if you're unwilling to pray with those people, it's even harder to love those people. That's why we encourage attendance to the pre-service prayer. It starts at 9 o'clock. Because we're all guilty of sin, right? I mean, we don't relish in this fact. We relish in the fact that we're forgiven of that sin. So we are together all sinners saved by grace. And now grace is our definition and not the sin that we came from. But we look at each other and we pull out particular types of sin. And if we're unwilling to pray with each other, man, it's really, really going to be hard to love each other. In other words, when we truly love, we overlook a person's faults. I don't know about you, but I have at least two faults in my life. My wife is better at multiplication than I am, and so her number may be different than mine. But You know, that's what parents do with kids, isn't it? We know that our kids have 
particular or certain types of problems, and we know that they're not perfect, yet that does not change our love for them, does it? That's quite a concept. How would our society change if, if husbands loved their wives and would actually apply this to their relationships? I'm willing to overlook her faults because I love her. Or wives to husbands. I'm willing to overlook his faults because I love him. But what happens is that we fall in arming ourselves. When we fail to arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ, and then when we fail to do that, we are not dead to our sins, but alive in our sins. But we have been called to die to our sinfulness. When you're alive in sin, what do you want? When somebody does evil to you, what do you want? I want revenge. But when you're alive in Christ and somebody does evil to them, what do you do? You want forgiveness for them. You want to cover up their sin. Meaning it's, it's not exposed anymore. This isn't the definition of their life. We're believing for forgiveness for them so that they, this is not the definition of who they are. Christ can be the definition. So when you love and you love well, you're actually going to pray for them. You're going to, I think this should be in Scripture, but you're going to pray for the one that persecutes you. It is in Scripture. I just wanted to point that out. Remember, not until you are dead are you really free from sin. And so what does the prayer life do? It kills us. <laughs> the prayer life kills us. If you don't know what I'm talking about, try to pray. It's going to kill you. <laughs> Try to pray for more than 10 minutes. It'll kill you. And then once you realize you're not dead physically, you're dead spiritually, pray for 15. And watch how that kills you. <laughs> and you know what it's going you know to show you in the death process? It's going to show you all the things you'd rather be doing than pray. And then it's going to show you what you're really alive to. But that's what it's calling you to die to. Prayer, life, kills us. It won't allow us to live the way of flesh that we would like to live. It brings us face to face with who we really are. And then it allows us to see Jesus more clearly. I don't know about you, but when I am faced with the, with the reality that I would really, really like to do something other than, for example, pray, it shows my carnality and it shows me what I have to die to, but then it also shows me that, man, I'm really rebellious about this particular thing, and so then what do I have the opportunity to do? Jesus, look, I can't bring you anything good, so take my bad. It gives me an opportunity then to press in deeper and seek the Lord more. In the presence of Jesus, we love. Everybody say, we love. We would cover our friend's sin with our love. The opposite of covering a person's sin is what? Exposing it. If we're more concerned with pointing out other people's sins, guarantee you, guarantee you, that's not loving them. So who is the accuser of the brethren? He has a name. Diablo. <laughs> Satan, right? Isn't it that old enemy's position? Isn't it Satan who travels the earth? In Job 1.7, the Lord said to him, Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth in it. He's the one that's roaming to look to accuse you. When we accuse somebody and when we stand to say, nope, this is your fault, this is my judgment, I am going to point this out to you. We have more in common with the spirit of the Antichrist than we do with the spirit of Christ. Right? Can you see that? When we're concerned with pointing out people's flaws and pointing out their error and pointing out positions where they're wrong and pointing all these things that we disagree about, we have more in common with the spirit of the Antichrist than we do with Jesus Christ. 
Hatred exposes sin. Hatred loves to put sin on the cross and crucify it. Hatred loves to display other people's sins, but ignoring that plank that's in our own eye. But love covers a multitude of sins. That doesn't mean that we accept sin. Knowing of somebody's sinfulness doesn't mean, and then wanting to cover it, that doesn't mean you accept it. That means you go in brotherly love and you try to make it right. And you say, hey, if they've done something against you, guy, girl, let's talk. Let's get together. Let's do this in respect because you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. I am too. We're family. We can't let this get in our way. Let's work it out. It means that we forgive sins. How are we going to love somebody without first forgiving them? Has anybody ever figured that one out? How do you actually love somebody without forgiving them? So let's go back to 1 Peter 4, right after telling us to look at a, a life seriously so that we can pray, with, which results in us loving each other. He says here in, in 4, verse 9 and 10, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. You know how we grumble? We grumble like, why are you asking me to do that? Look, there's other people in the church that can do that. Why aren't they doing that? Or you're telling me that um, I have a certain gift, I have a certain talent and ability that you want me to use for the Lord? How dare you? <laughs> But we justify it in our grumbling as the body of Christ. I'm not talking specifically to prayer house, although those things do exist, right? I'm talking about the church as a whole. Christians, we've been given. We believe in a God almighty, eternal, lasting forevermore, the creator of all good things, right? And he has given us through his spirit giftings and talents and abilities to operate within the body of Christ, but to show the world love. And what do we do? We grumble, we complain, we talk about how we don't actually have to do what the Lord has called us to do. We just find it ironic. Peter's saying, hey, you guys, you, you people, my brothers, my sisters, stop grumbling, stop complaining, do it with joy, do it with hostility, like get it out there, serve one another in love. God loves us. Let's love each other. This is not a pass if you're young. If you're inexperienced and you don't have a lot of experience on your belt, this is not a pass for you to sit silently and not speak, or what is the thing? Don't speak until you're spoken to. This isn't that kind of a pass. If you're a young person in love with Jesus and God has given you a desire to do something, you better do it. Because God has given you that. This is not a pass if you're an old person and you're retired. If God has given you an ability to do it, you do it because God has called you to do it. Believers in Jesus are called to be hospitable and to serve each other because we love each other. And if we don't love each other, well... According to Scripture, you don't have to get mad at me. You don't even know who God is. This means that the body have to use whatever gifts we have received from God to help those around us. If hard times challenge you to dig into your own savings account for the sake of your brother or sister, are you going to do it? Are you willing to do it? It's pretty easy for us to love people who don't require anything from us, isn't it? It's very, very easy to love the people who don't want anything from me. Oh, yeah, they've never asked for anything. I really love that guy. Or uh, him again, all he does is ask me for stuff. Really hard to love people who constantly are needy people, as, as we say. Do you know what our human nature wants to do? It wants to point out a person's faults 
when they have a need. Oh, they're asking for money again. Look at what they're doing, though. Look at how they're not living right. Look at how they've gotten themselves in that kind of a financial situation to begin with. Look at their sinfulness. Look at, look at all this when, in reality, if we have the mind of Christ, we're going to say, wow, look at how Jesus can forgive them. Look at how I can display love to them. Look at how I can encourage them and help them in their financial troubles instead of criticizing them constantly because they're making poor choices. Hey, look at that nobody has ever taught them correctly. Look at how they were raised by a single mom who was overwhelmed in life and didn't have enough attention on them or a single dad who was trying to work three jobs to support them and he was out of the house so much they had to raise themselves. Eight years old is too young to be called a man. And look at this eight-year-old boy who had to grow up teaching himself stuff and he got himself in financial trouble and now I'm going to criticize him for it? Where are the dads to come alongside him and say, Son, let me help you. Let me show you love of God. Let me show you help. Let me show you love. Because God says love covers a multitude of sins. We tend to want to uncover sins because then we feel justified by letting others wallow in their situation. What I'm calling you and what I'm calling the church to do is, is the same here as Scripture is Whatever gifting you have, serve others with it. Serve others without pay. Don't look for reward. Because you're going to find it, and you know what's going to happen? Moth and rust are going to destroy it. Thieves are going to be able to steal it. Store it for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, and thieves cannot break in and steal. Use whatever gift you have to serve others. Administer God's grace in various forms. Look for opportunities to serve others. We live in a very skeptical day about the church. However, people are getting nervous about the future. Have you ever noticed that? People are nervous about the future. Nervous about security. What's going to happen to my stocks? Am I going to have Social Security? What's going to happen? I don't have a retirement account. What's going to happen to me? It, Politically, where are things going to go? Are we going to get in a war? Are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? They're nervous about all these things that you can't control. People are getting nervous about the future, and the church is one of the first places that they should turn back to. What happened after 9-11? Church attendance psh, spiked through the roof. Nobody's going to stay at a church that doesn't love others. If your church... In America, if our church has an attendance problem, that's probably because we have a love problem. Can I say that? Will you receive it? <laughs> so we need to be spiritually active and spiritually active in the way of prayer going forward for our church, but as, the, as a whole as well. But beyond that, we need to make Jesus known in our community. We cannot do that if we're not willing to love people who look different than we do or listen to different music than we listen to or drive a different car than we drive. If, if those petty little things keep us from loving other people, God help us. We need to be spiritually active in going in, in the prayer room for those people, not criticizing them and condemning them because they're different. How will they come to believe in Jesus? How will they know His truth if they cannot see our love? Today, you see before us, today is our communion. Today is Communion Sunday. This is where we remember and observe the ultimate expression of love. The title of today's message is Love Each Other. There's a, a perfect, this is a, a, a perfect fit for our communion service, which we're going to come into right now. If there is no unity within the body, there is no way, listen, there is no way that we can be effective in our community. John 13, 35 says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, we've got a, we've got a car show coming up. And for, quite literally, this is the seventh year running the car show. And 
in terms of if, in terms of my interaction with it, it'll be the the fourth car show. It is really on my heart. That's the whole reason behind it. That's the reason my dad started it too. Is the car show is designed to bring people from the world to the property, to the church. Not that salvation has to do with the property, but bring the people from the world to the people of God so that the people of God can express the love of God to people who do not know love. And you know what we get? Oh, I don't like car shows. Pastor, why are we doing a car show? Because there's people that need to be loved there. I'm not trying to, I'm not calling any one person out in particular. I'm calling out a spirit and a mindset that sets in to stubborn and rebellious people. That's what I'm calling out. Not you as a person. I'm calling out that spirit that would deceive and distort the very work of God. We're having a car show because there's people who need to know the love of Jesus. That's why. So maybe we won't have chairs (laughs) and everybody has to walk. So you have to get out of our comfort zone and go walk. But hear my heart on it, not, not necessarily the, the, the words that I'm saying. Hear my heart on it, is we as a church, if we don't love one another, it's going to be quite impossible to love the community that we're called to love, right? And what is our call? To love. It's a pretty big issue with Jesus. If, if he says, hey, others are going to know that you're mine by seeing that love that you have. If we cannot love each other as fellow believers, how can we claim to have the Spirit of Christ in us? I've asked um, Christian and Doug if you guys would come up first. These guys are two of the elders. We have four elders. These guys are two of them, and I've asked them to lead us in communion. Usually when we go into our time of sharing the Lord's table, we read from 1 Corinthians 11. We usually start in verse 23. We're going to go back to that in a moment here. But, but first, I want to read to you what it says in verses 27 through 30. In 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 30, it says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why, listen, that is why many of you are weak and sick. It's not just a physical thing. Weak in mind, sick in mind, sick in spirit. And a number of you have fallen asleep. So as these gentlemen lead us in the way of communion and and before we take the elements and before we do all of that, just remember a follower of Jesus ought to examine themselves first. Before we take communion today, I want you to examine your heart. I want you to examine yourself. Truly, deeply examine yourself. This relates specifically to our relationships with those in the body of Christ. Love each other. Love each other is Christ's admonition to us. We must recognize the body of Christ. In other words, if you're if you're a part of the body of Christ and yet you hate you have hatred towards one another, man, that's gotta go. Big time. It's like having cancer. Hatred in your hatred in your heart for someone else. Is like having cancer, but instead of seeking treatment to fix the cancer, you're like, hey, what's actually going to make my cancer worse? And then you feed your cancer that to make it grow. It's like having hate in your heart. Jesus puts high priority on us because it is the primary way the world will know that we are his disciples if we have love for one another. So I'm, I'm going to turn it over to these guys as they lead us through. But really, I'm asking you now, set it in your heart. Really examine yourself. Truly, honestly do that. Be honest before the Lord. I'm not asking you to stand up and tell me how you hate one another. (laughs) But confirm it in your heart how much of a wretch we're trying to resurrect. 
How much of the old man are we really trying to resurrect when we hate each other? And if you don't see it in those terms of saying hate, I really encourage you to think of it in that way. When you have aught with your brother and you won't go make it right with them, you're hating them. You're hating them. And that's not what Christ has done. Christ has come to love us and forgive us. So I'm going to turn it over to these guys. Examine in your heart right now.